Well, it's true. We've our 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 story is our revels are about to end, um, but they end on a high note, talking about really the most the most challenging and yet the most inspiring moments of the Grand Tour. So we're going to see really how uh, the Vatican museums were in a certain se certain sense, a little bit too successful for their own good. But I think I'm, I might be getting ahead of myself. So let's get started with a little of the screen here. Here's our slideshow. And I just wanna start out with uh, where I kind of left off in our in our story because last week we had this kind of fun interlude at least it was fun for me i hope it was fun for you uh talking about the amazing female artists in rome but to kind of get back to really what was happening in the city thanks to the papacy because of the grand tour remember that we see this tremendous amount of urban planning so the city changes drastically as they build these beautiful things but always with an eye to the faith so those spanish steps they're supposed to lead us up to what? What sits on the Spanish steps? It sits, it's a, it's a church. When we look at the Trevi Fountain, you remember how we were looking at this way of thinking about how time was passing and nothing transformed as dramatically as the Vatican Museum. So if the other works in the city were kind of a lead up, Pope Pius VI, the work in the Vatican Museum was more than anything else, a way to speak to the secularists of the Grand Tour and give them a context with which they can look at that ancient art, but also be reminded of the Christian story. And so even though we already talked about what Pius VI did in the museum, I wanna, I wanna sort of start this talk with the meaning of the museum. What was the message Pius VI was trying to send during what were obviously extremely troubled times. So this, but this budding republic, this noise coming across the Alps of this uh, new lay state, this secular state, who needs this first estate anymore? The threat to the, to the monarchy, which in many ways Pius VI didn't fully see coming. You see this lovely picture by a man named Stefano Piale here. In the uh, on the right hand side, this is Pius VI overlooking his brand new museum, and sort of this is this sort of very on the on the left hand side. You can see his uh, architect um, withholding the plans here. This is Michelangelo Simonetti, who is the man who is responsible for the rebuilding of the uh, Pio Clementino Museum, and the man kneeling presenting the work of art, the Antinous to be precise is uh, Giovanni uh, Ennio Quirino Visconti. And so this is the Visconti family that will actually be the ones, it'll be first the father, then the son, who are in charge of kind of putting together a narrative. Actually, the father is Giovanni Battista and the son is Ennio Quirino. So they're putting together a narrative. So we're gonna walk through, before we do anything else, we're gonna walk through the idea of Pius VI Museum and get a sense of the narrative he was trying to get across. So you come up the famous Scala Simonetti. I think you, you all remember coming to the museums and your first impact under Pius VI was to encounter this grand staircase. You've seen it every time you've come. You came up the grand staircase and you entered into this room, which was shaped like a Greek cross and you would then start to proceed further. Everything about these rooms is intended to have a sense of installation. One of the most important things that Visconti and Simonetti do together under the Aegeus of Pius VI is they are the first people to think about installation. So I'm going to deviate from our path for one second just to show you what, in my opinion, is the most beautiful example of the completely innovative installation of the Vatican Museums. And so I, to repeat myself, this is the very first time in the history of museum making that the people putting together the museum are thinking about creating a setting for the works of art that will be more like a natural setting where the works would have been and helps you to kind of get a sense of, in this, in, to one extent, the fine spots of the works, but also the way the works would have originally been seen. So this beautiful, this is again, my favorite example is what's called the room of the biga. When you get to the top of the Simonetti staircase and you start to head down 
towards the gallery of the Candelabra uh, and eventually to the Sistine Chapel, you pass this incredibly exquisite room. It's a very small round room. This room is designed after the Baths of Tivoli and it contains athletes. So here's the reasoning of this collectionism. You have a room that's designed like a bathhouse, right? That's where the athletes go. That's where you find the mosaics in, in bathhouses are of athletes. And so the athletes, after they finish their games and they're victorious, they head to the baths. They have just finished excavating the baths of Hadrian, the bath of the Heliocomenus in, in Tivoli. And so they know what an ancient bath complex looks like. So you have these little openings and then you have very, very large windows and you have this domed, domed ceiling. So when they design this space, where they're going to put the statues of the athletes. And you can see um, there's the Discobolus over here. You have a uh, victorious charioteer. You have the two horse chariot racing over the finish line. You have a huntress over on another side. So you have this image of athletes inside a place where you would naturally expect to find these athletes. So on one hand, you've put together this, this in a way that's very evocative of the fine spot, the evocative where you would have found statues like this. But at the second, round, the second level, we also begin to uh, address what is it that St. Paul says he always compares holiness, he frequently compares holiness to athletics, right? run so as to win the race. I have fought the good fight. So this chariot that appears to be surging over this finish line, the finish line is also a metaphor for heaven. What do we call the early martyrs, but heaven's athletes. So it's got this great double way that it's working. Returning to, so this is what you see, this is the, the, the room as you've seen it today. Again, the charioteer, you have the discobolus, another discobolus and the biga in the center. Now, as you entered uh, back into the Museum Pium or the Museo Pio Clementinum, this is when you reach the top of the staircase. So you come to the top of the staircase and you come into the room that's shaped like a Greek cross and you look through and in the background, originally there was a statue of the muse. So the, you, you see this gigantic statue of uh, a figure which is the personification of artistic inspiration, it's the Muse Urania. And so you're walking through this very sort of powerfully decorated space, you're drawn into the space by this muse, by this, by this, this vision of inspiration. Again, today the um, Urania has been replaced by the astonishing find of an over-life-size bronze statue of Hercules. So in uh, the 1860s, the, the Urania was replaced with the, with the magnificent bronze Hercules. Then you enter into a room that's shaped like the Pantheon. So again, this idea of installation, the room is designed by Michelangelo Simonetti and all the way around it, you have these enormous statues of gods. So it gives you the idea of a plausible original setting for these god statues. And it gives you a little bit of a hint of what the Pantheon may have looked like. And the room of course is, is, is awesome in the sense of, you come in and you sort of take this deep breath to be surrounded by these incredibly beautiful works. This sort of cute little preview. If you look down here in the corner, you'll see a little image of Laocoon, which you and I all know is not visible. It can't be casting a shadow there. But the designer is helping us to understand which way we're supposed to move in the museum. So we go into the Sala Rotonda. Again, today like this, actually not today like this because there are no crowds in the museums these days. And then we turn right and start to walk out to where Julius II originally founded the museum in what was then the courtyard of the Belvedere Palace. Today, you know it as the octagonal courtyard. And so you turn, you walk through this room of the muses. So we continue with this idea of muses. The uh, first building that Pope Sixtus, Pope, Pope Pius the sixth built for his new museum was this room, this room that's designed to hold muses found in Hadrian's villa in Tivoli. And so what, what is his first construction? 
a room of muses for his new museum. So very kind of clearly building on the tradition that began the Vatican museums out in that courtyard where Julius II first placed his own personal works of art when he was elected Pope around between 1503, actually placed them about 1507, when he first placed his works of art there and thereby giving rise to the Vatican Museum. So Pius VI is sort of picking up this great tradition of, of generosity to the museum. So you go out to the courtyard, this is where Laocoon is, this is where the Apollo Belvedere is, and then you turn around to come back. And as you turn around to come back, you once again find yourself looking through the room of the muses to where you see a seated figure. It's actually a seated figure of an emperor, but it has a sort of distressingly sim distressing similarity to Julius II. Actually, it's immaterial whether or not it's Julius II, it's not, but it, um, it, it's a deified emperor. So we're walking through this room, we're looking at all these beautiful sculptures, and as we turn around and start to come back, what greets us? An image of a man who is recognized as a god. Where things went wildly south with the Christian community was when the Christians would not accept, they would not worship, they would not sacrifice before, they would not eat sacrificial meat, they wouldn't dribble incense on the fire before these men who were worshipped as gods. So we begin to get a sort of funny nagging feeling in our head like, well, wait a minute, this was not a very Christian friendly society. And then you exit, you walk through the rotunda room again, and this is your exit. You are, you are now facing the, the, the Simonetti staircase one more time. You're going to take the stair to the left or the right. On the right, the top of the right, you'll find the um, room of the Biga, and then you're going to take the, the pathway down to the Sistine Chapel. And this is where that little niggling question that's going around in the back of your head might actually make itself heard which would be, I think I'm walking through the Pope's museum and um, I haven't seen anything Christian yet. What, what a strange collection Pius VI put forth. He opens up this big museum. He invites everybody there. We've got the King of Sweden coming. You march through the collection of, of art on the part of, that belongs to the Pope that he's lovingly collected. He's spent a fortune building a new, new, new place for. And there's absolutely nothing Christian there. And as a matter of fact, a kind of a funny thing is when you start to look around, you begin to realize, well, well, wait a minute. Isn't, um, isn't, uh, isn't, aren't those statues the kinds of things that Christians were killed if they wouldn't sprinkle incense in front of it? And so they had, um, placed in the room of the rotonda, there is a large purple bowl. You've seen it. So you can see it right there, the large porphyry bowl, which is placed in the middle of the rotunda. And it's very, very it's unusual. It's very, very special for its type. It's a bowl that was, that was quarried from Egypt out of this precious stone called porphyry in the first century AD. And we all know, everybody knows where this came from. It was originally used to decorate the halls of the house of Emperor Nero. So can you imagine as you start walking through the museum and you're thinking about it a little bit more and you, it might occur to you, there's something else that's kind of funny. Um, wasn't Nero the guy who killed St. Peter and St. Paul? But it not he the way, I think like a couple hundred other Christians while he was at it. So what kind of museum is this? What kind of papacy is this? What have they done? Is he sold out everything? These are works of people who persecuted, were, were intolerant, who oppressed the Christians. Why, why, why is the Pope keeping them? And the answer is in that room shaped like a Greek cross. So this room here, again, the room that's shaped like the Greek cross, that's a big heads up. On the left and the right, you have these two sarcophagi. They are also made of porphyry. So the same stone as you saw before. These are the sarcophagi of St. Helena, who is the mother of Constantine, and the sarcophagus of St. Costanza, who is the daughter of Constantine. So you go from one, amazing monument in this purple purple type granite which belonged to Nero oppressor of Christians you walk out the door and you see these two monuments dedicated to the mother of the man who legalized Christianity and the daughter of the man who legalized Christianity and what is Pius telling us Pius is telling us that for 
250 years, yes, okay, the Romans persecuted the Christians, tried to wipe them out. But after 250 years, what did the Romans do? They became Christian. And that's what the Vatican museums were. That's what the message was that Pius VI was trying to get across. It was the story of the impossible conversion. Absolutely, who would have put money on Peter and Paul? And yet, when Rome fell, the Christians were there to pick up the pieces. And that museum, the whole design was there to remind people that yes, the Romans, hardcore, they believed in men as, as gods. They were too big to fail. They were this enormous structure. And yet, and yet these people found their way to Christianity. In that case, anybody can. And so it was a very, very, very powerful message. You can see now a little bit better, the porphyry, uh, uh, bowl of Nero, the two porphyry sarcophagi, and you walk away, not with a finger wagging message, but a way of understanding the Christian relationship to the ancient world, which is very, very different than the one that Edward Gibbon was proposing, which we talked about in our earlier lectures back in the second lecture. And when we talk about Edward Gibbon, who believes in this, you know, Christianity is what brought down the Roman Empire. Instead, this is a story about the conversion of the Roman Empire that allowed the greatness of that empire, the greatness of its laws, the greatness, the beauty of its art to survive through the custodianship of the Christian world. So it's a very interesting way of conceiving of what a museum should do. Unfortunately, this was way too successful in collecting art and perhaps not as successful as one might hope for transmitting the message. Because of course, the greatest threat was coming on the other side of the Alps. And so uh, we have the imminent French Revolution beginning in 1789 and culminating with the execution of um, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette in the course of, um, of 1793. And it does not take long from that moment for the revolution to spill over the Alps and start making their way into, into Italy. And one of the more problematic moments will be when uh, the French troops begin to, begin to make their way uh, across the Alps. And by 1796, they are led by a young Napoleon Bonaparte who has very, very, very great dreams. And um, Napoleon begins to think about how to, um, thinks about how to create the greatness of this Roman Empire. He's sort of this love of the Roman Empire. Of course, as you know, he'll eventually become emperor. And one of the things he wants to do is to reprise the ancient custom of the ancient Romans of looting other countries. So you would have Augustus brings back the spoils of war. You have Scipione Africanus bringing back the spoils of war. We have the stories of the parades and the works of arts and the Greek statues that, that were brought to Rome. And Napoleon decides to try the same thing. He's going to collect works of art from all of his conquered countries, and he will put them into his museum, which will be called the Museum, the Musée Napoleon, but you know it as the Louvre. Now, what is interesting is that all along, visiting the museums, visiting the art collections, together with the grand tourists, or perhaps more correctly, as grand tourists were the scoping party for Napoleon or for the for the what would eventually be the directorate. They were out looking at these works, making lists of the works that they thought would be the most appropriate to bring together in the ultimate art museum, which would be housed in Paris in this great moment. And the man behind this, of course, was Vivant Denon. And you know that Denon is one of the names of the wings of the, uh, of the Louvre. And you know it is the wing that is the most famous. The Denon wing is the one that contains the Mona Lisa and the the, the wedding at Cana by Veronese, the Caravaggio works, and this, it's, it's the Italian art section. And that is because Vivant Denon was really in charge of putting together the requisition lists that they would want to eventually create the Louvre. And so in 1796, uh, there was a defeat, the, Napoleon, the, the, the Napoleon's troops defeated. Uh, the troops, as it were, of Pope Pius VI, and in what is called the Treaty of Bologna, the first treaty, the Pope was required to pay an indemnity 
and turn over 100 works of art. Now, this is a brand new experiment, experiment on the part of Napoleon. Napoleon had already his first foray in seeing maybe, maybe if I take these works of art, it will fly, was when he had conquered the king of Sardinia earlier in the year. And so earlier in the year, he had conquered Sardinia and to kind of test the waters of what would happen if he requisitioned works of art, he requisitioned a series of works out of Sardinia and no one really said anything. So emboldened, he came into the Italian peninsula and he ordered that his committee would choose 100 works from throughout the papal states, so in Bologna, in Perugia, in Rome, and those would be brought back to, those would be brought back to Paris together with about 500 manuscripts from the Vatican Library. And so you see these sort of uh, 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 cartoons. It was, it, was, it was really quite a quite a shocking thing for people to see this kind of um, depredation. And as a matter of fact, if you look over here on the right, you can see the image of the Pope sort of standing in the balcony watching his works being uh, depleted. And of course, you see over here a soldier who's removing a gold rosary and some of the gold plate, like the patens and the liturgical objects, those will all be melted down. So he'll take all the liturgical objects and things that are religious and he'll have it melted down to pay the troops. It's a, it's a rather harrowing story what happens here. Um, the works were then taken um, out of Rome and brought to Paris. And so you can see these carts. Uh, filled with uh, works of art. As a matter of fact, just sort of these, if you look at these sort of well bailed carts, um, they included, this group includes the Laocoon, the Apollo Belvedere, uh, the, uh, and, and, and again, many, many other works. And just to be kind of clear, um, after the Treaty of Bologna, uh, there was an incident in Rome and Napoleon or the directorate took the opportunity to uh, squeeze the Pope even more. So the second uh, treaty, which was called the Treaty of Tolentino in 1797, ultimately saw Napoleon's soldiers able to enter any place they wanted and take anything they want. And so at the end of the day, the first number I gave you was 100. But at the end of the day, the number of works that we know were taken, that is you know, leaving aside the, the medallions that were shoved into soldiers' pockets and things that were hidden away by the various soldiers, soldiers as they were just looting, uh, we know there were 500 works that were transported to France. And I'll just give you sort of the quick, uh, so the little spoiler alert, um, of, the, of the 500 works, only 296 returned. So it was a very, very devastating uh, event. Um, then uh, shortly after the Treaty of Tolentino in around 1798, there was another incident in Rome and uh, Napoleon deciding that the art was not enough. Um, the library was not enough. The suppression of religious orders was not enough. He took 82 year old semi paralyzed Pius VI and put him in a carriage and drove him around Europe until he died. He was treated Horribly, we have many, many eyewitness accounts of how he was how he was maltreated during his trip. He grew increasingly aged. He couldn't move part of his body. Clearly, it had some kind of a stroke, and he's rattled through these carriages. Remember, how I was telling you, we started our conversation we were together talking about suspension and what it's like to drive in a carriage. He wasn't allowed to see anybody, short for the few members of the curia who traveled with him, and he eventually died alone in Valence in um, in France. And it, 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 his body, I think, some of you might know his body was eventually transported back to Rome and he's buried in the um, in the crypt of St. Peter's but he actually died abandoned alone by under because of the maltreatment uh, under the directorate so really things looked very 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 bad so if you can imagine this glittering museum all the excitement of having opened the museum it begins to abruptly end when you have the pope who dies on august 29th of 1799 and apparently there was one newspaper in france that simply ran the headline pious the last so it's done, according to the French, it's done. No more papacy. The art has been transported 
Italy's been carved up into little states for Napoleon's family. Everything seems to be great. And to the point where the treasures taken from the Vatican museums are now paraded through the streets of Paris, people overjoyed to see the Cupid. You saw the Apollo. Here's the Laocoon. There's the Medici Venus being paraded through the streets and this proud moment, the same way the triumphal parades took place. You know how we see um, uh, the menorah inside the Arch of Titus, that same kind of parade, except with the looted treasures from the Vatican. But the church did not say die. They went to this little island in Venice, San Giorgio Maggiore, and in 1799, in a secret conclave, <laughs> took a very long time because I think everybody was saying, please, please, not me, not me, not me. Uh, they chose a man named Barnaba Chiarimonti in 1799. Barnaba Chiarimonti became Pope. And the first thing he did is he took the name Pius VII, which tells you a little bit the kind of guy you're dealing with. From that moment, uh, the, the reason why the conclave was held in Venice was because it was under Austrian protection. There was no, all of the areas within Italy which were under French control, the idea of a conclave was prohibited. And so the little island or the little Venice was still under Austrian protection. And so uh, the conclave took place there, but the Austrians kind of felt that at this point they would want to control the papacy. And they told Pius VII, you're going to stay here and we're going to run things from here. And Pius VII said, nope, the Pope belongs in Rome. And the only ship they would give him was this junky old freighter without a kitchen. And in these wretched conditions, he made his way all the way around the peninsula to go from Venice all the way around the boot to Rome. He immediately got to Rome. And of course, what's the first thing that happens? He gets to, he gets, he gets to the museum and he takes a look at his museum, right? So imagine coming through the Vatican and seeing everything gone because that's what it looked like in 1799. No more Apollo, no more Medici Venus, no more Laocoon, just these big empty spaces in what had just been just a couple years earlier, the shining star of museums in the world. It was now sort of empty, dusty nails hanging on the walls where the pictures used to be. But that again did not stop Pius VII. Pius VII teamed up with a remarkable artist and really a very, very, very remarkable man. The more I read about Antonio Canova, the more I realize that he truly was a very special person. Antonio Canova um, became the head of antiquities, as it were, not like there were a lot of antiquities, but he took the job of trying to reconstitute the museum for Pius VII. You see around here, I put some of his works just so that you guys could just realize what a magnificent sculptor, one of these you must have seen, this Three Graces, modeled after the famous Three Graces in the Vatican, is Mary Magdalene, the famous Paulina Bonaparte. This Venus over here, the Venus Vitrix, uh, was meant to replace the Venus of um, the Venus taken from Florence. And of course, I think Apollo and Psyche might be one of my favorite sculptors. And so he carved, Antonio Canova had carved, it was actually for originally for another patron, the statue of Perseus. And you may have seen, I know you know this statue quite well, but the statue of Perseus, one of the interesting things about the Perseus is you've seen him in the octagonal courtyard. And you notice how he looks just like Apollo? So basically, Perseus was there to substitute the Apollo. So instead of sort of giving up and throwing their hands in the air saying, you know, oh, we, get, we, we can't be bothered with this, Canova carves a work that will take the place of the Apollo. It's very, very similar in style, different subject matter. And then for the energy of Laocoon, the other sculpture that's been taken, he carved these, these two uh, Pugili, which had been carved in um, boxers, which had been carved in 1800 and um, actually carved in, in in, in 17, 1798, and they're purchased by, um, all three works were purchased for the collection. So Canova starts rebuilding the collection. He puts in his own work. He starts buying series of works that are uh, uh, coming onto the market. Um, and so uh, he buys a lot of little things, so not these sort of big fancy sculptures, he's buying a lot of sort of small things. And that is how the Chiarimonti Museum is born. You know, this uh, long gallery that leads down to at the end of that end of that um, doorway is where you see the gallery of inscriptions, and then beyond the gallery of the inscriptions is where the old office of the patrons. That used to be the access to where the old office of the patrons was. 
And so sure enough, all of this defiance on the part of Pius VII definitely got the attention of Napoleon. And so duel in due course, Pius VII was arrested. However, he was a much younger and much tougher man. And so here you see two paintings of this. These are sort of imaginary images of Pius, uh, Pius facing off with Napoleon. Um, I actually have one. I've been trying all week to take a picture of, of my own my own work because I love this. I love this moment very, very much. Um, Pius VII will become a kind of rock star for defying um, um, Napoleon who will humiliate him in every turn. So at one point, uh, he's uh, he's sent he's, he's he's stuck in a room and and every all the people who knew him who were there said that he was sort of stuck in a room by himself. He mended his own clothes and he spent his time reading his prayers because he had originally kind of started out as a Benedictine monk. And so he just went, reverted back into Benedict, Benedictine monk, monk mode for the years. I mean, these very long periods of time that he was imprisoned. And um, he held out against Napoleon um, in, in many different things, although you'll see that there is some major concessions. During his time there, he met with Jean-Louis David. And this is really, again, an amazing story because David, he's like the he's the 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 portraitist. He's the image maker of the revolution. Like he is Joe French Revolution. And yet, when he meets this guy, when he meets this 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 monkish little pope who's sitting in his room darning his own socks, he has this incredible quotation. He's going to do a portrait of him, and he says, um, "This dear dear old man, what a venerable face! How simple he is, and what a fine head." a real Italian head, the eye sockets large and well-defined. This is a real Pope, a real priest. He's as poor as St. Peter. Even the gold embroidery of his cape is artificial. The more credit to him, well, he is a real priest. So David ends up doing three different portraits of him including this extremely sympathetic portrait. It's quite a beautiful portrait. And he was modeling his portrait after Raphael's portrait, but in this, this, this writing about it, he feels that he did more justice to Pius than Raphael did for Julius, because where Julius looks kind of beaten and tired, even though Pius VII is essentially a prisoner of Napoleon, he's kept in utter poverty, he's humiliated at every turn, he carries this kind of dignity and alertness to him. So, so David really wanted to um, uh, uh, celebrate that. But David worked for Napoleon and Napoleon wanted a gigantic painting of what would be the greatest humiliation of all for Pope Pius VII, which is his presence at Napoleon's incoronation as the, as the emperor of the planet, apparently, as, as emperor, not Holy Roman Emperor, but as emperor. And uh, what the, the, the original idea what actually happened was that during this ceremony in which the Pope was supposed to crown the emperor the way he had done with Charlemagne, so you're, catch, you're, you're putting together the ancient history of France, Napoleon didn't want the authority to appear to come from the papacy. And so this is a drawing, this earlier version by, by David, where we see that with the Pope sitting in the back of him, like, you know, why am I here anyway? You have, uh, you, have, you have Napoleon crowning his own head. And then even another drawing where they were thinking about having this kind of half-hearted blessing being done by, um, by, by Pius VII. But again, these were all moments that were designed to really create the maximum humiliation of, um, of, 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 of Pius VII, who handled it with such a Plum. And then again, this embarrassment to Italy or this humiliation of Italy, where at the wedding between Napoleon and um, uh, 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 Marie Therese of Austria, you see, look what is in the background. You have Raphael's transfiguration. You have the Cecilia uh, by, by, by Raphael from Bologna. You have the deposition or the, 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 the lamentation by Perugino. You have the Odi altarpiece by Raphael. I mean, they're marching on their way to this party under the works that are looted from the Vatican Museums. And of course, the English never missed an opportunity to make fun of the situation. They saw Pius VII's presence there as a kind of um, okaying of Napoleon. And so uh, they made a point of mocking both Napoleon and the um, 
and the Pope. Um, ultimately, Napoleon, as you know, fell. And, uh, and, 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 and Napoleon fell. And in 1814, after Waterloo, uh, in 1815, they held the Congress of Vienna. And this is where the really remarkable part of the story goes on. It's actually really, it's a very interesting story with, with, with the Pope and Napoleon. He's arrested twice. Uh, the second time he comes back, he literally gets treated like a rock star. There's sort of crazed ecstatic people in the Piazza del Popolo. It's actually a really, really, really interesting story. I just that I only have a certain amount of time. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, the, with the fall of Napoleon, once Waterloo comes along, uh, now the, the, re, the reorganization of Europe has to take place. And what, uh, what makes this interesting is that when the Congress of Vienna takes place to decide, you know, well, now that Napoleon's redone the, the map of Europe, how do we get things back to the way we were, to the way they were, and will will we make changes? Pius VII did something that had never been done before, simply never been done before. He sent Antonio Canova to uh, argue for the return of the works, the works that had been taken. He said he went with the argument that the Treaty of Tolentino was under duress and that it was an illegal treaty and that those works should be returned. And you can be quite sure that the King of France, who had now, after Napoleon's fall, the restoration of the monarchy, the King of France said, oh no, no, I'm sorry, but that um, you signed it, so it, it holds. And he had on his side, the Tsar of Russia, who you may notice was busily trying to get stuff into the Hermitage. So you have two major, major monarchs who are like, ah, yeah, no, he signed a treaty and that's the way it goes. But the English, the Austrians, and the King of Prussia were on the side of Pius. And particularly a major, major figure was Wellington. Wellington, who had defeated Napoleon, was sort of a first person actor. So it was really the English at the end of the day who successfully pushed through the return of the works. And this was extremely, extremely difficult because for example, Denon would not let people into the Louvre. So when Anton Antonio Canova, went to go to the Louvre with this documentation that had been decided that these works were supposed to be returned, he walks in and Vivant Denon is at the door and he says, you are not an ambassador, you are an emballeur, you're, you're the packer, you're not an ambassador, you're a packer. And so, uh, and so slammed the door on him. And uh, Antonio Canova apparently had a very clever retort to that line, which was when people said, are all the French thieves? Uh, his answer was, oh no, just a Bonaparte. Get it, get it. just Bonaparte. Anyway, the a good part in Italian. At any rate, um, the, uh, the Austrian and English troops had to, had to go in and stand there with guns at the ready to take the works out. And you can see in the background of this painting, you can see the Laocoon and the Apollo in the light. So this is already celebrating the return of the works. Interestingly, um, this kind of bromance between uh, George IV and Pius VII culminates in this exchange of portraits. And so a portrait, Thomas Lawrence did a portrait of um, Pius VII in 1819, which was sent to England. And uh, the portrait that Thomas Lawrence had done um, in 1816 was sent to Pius. And so they kind of, they exchanged they became friends on Facebook, I guess is how we would put it today. Um, and so we see, you look at the carts that are showing the return of the works. This bust over here celebrates the role of Canova. Canova was very, very richly rewarded, but really it was his it was his stubbornness and his determination and really going day after day after day that managed to really create what is the ultimate precedent in art recovery law. So one of the things I'm telling you is one of the most exciting things about this Vatican Museum is that this is really the home of or the father of art recovery law. One of the boxes contained the Laocoon and it traveled over the Alps. It didn't go by water for fear of shipwreck. And when it was coming over the Alps, the, the box slipped and it um, tumbled. And um, there's actually still a mark on the Laocoon from where it was damaged from the return trip from, um, from France. And so uh, he also, Pius VII at this point, made a series of laws. The most famous one is called the Legge Papa, which had to do with the export of works from Italy. So the church had already had a sort of series of laws about exporting works, but we saw under Pius VII that basically the law was, I want first crack and then the rest of you can, the rest of you can take it. And as of the Legge Papa, the laws about travel and exporting works 
works of art became much, much, much more complicated. I don't know if any of you have ever purchased a work of art here in Italy, but if you purchase a work of art of a certain level, it has to go to a commission to be permitted to leave the country. And so you run the risk of not being able to get your, your work of art out of the country. And the fact of the matter is that that is because of the Legge Parca that was written in the wake of the um, written in the wake of the, the return of the works from France. And so the ultimate, of course, um, the ultimate uh, 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 celebration of the return of the works is this magnificent, magnificent gallery uh, known as the Braccio Nuovo, the new wing built under Pius VII by a man named Raffaele Stern. And if you look, you can see all these new concepts about um, museum design, including overhead skylighting. And so Canova had already begun putting in some skylights in the octagonal courtyard, but this entire section here was was designed with, with skylights so as to be able to really enhance the, um, the, uh, 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 the luminosity of the room. And then also this sort of placing works together so that you have the super high quality works side by side with works that are not of such high quality so that you can really get a sense of the overview and the, the range of ancient arts. So it's really a brilliant, brilliant thing. And now the museums were officially open. So uh, the custodians had uniforms and so did the director. So he see the custodians and the, the director was uh, their, their uniforms. Uh, they had an actually opening days. So you can see um, they were closed for the feast of the circumcision of the Lord, the epiphany. They closed for um, the Thursday of Carnivale. Easter, surprise, surprise. Um, the Ascension, Pentecost, Corpus Domini, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. They had in 1816 a staff of 14 people including the director, the subdirector, the custodian, and the sweepers of the people whose job it was to clean the museum. So we get a sense of really learning and thinking about for the very first time how to run a museum. And all this is taking place in 1816. And from then, you and I know that this museum has been growing ever since. And so in the 19th century, the additions of the Egyptian Museum, the Christian Museum, the Etruscan Museum came along. And the museum has just continued to grow, building new entrances and new ways of accommodating greater visitors. First, the steamships brought the Americans, and then airplanes began to bring people from all over the world. And the Vatican Museums, with its incredible repository of works, just grew and grew and thought more and more and more how to welcome all of these people and how to talk to people through the language of beauty. Each section of this museum has a story about its genesis, which is fascinating, filled with amazing people, brilliant ideas, and very, very, very faithful concepts of, 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 of what a museum is supposed to bring to the world. And so with that, I thank you. I thank you very, very much for this opportunity to talk about a museum that I love very, very, very much, one of my favorite places in the world. I'm happy I got to share a few things with you that I think people talk about a little bit less. They usually talk about Michelangelo and Raphael. It was a joy to be able to reveal some of these other aspects of the museums to you. Well, as thank you so much. I think for all of us who have been, you know, through the museums and, and appreciated them, I think the next time we're able to, to go in person, we'll have a, a really new perspective. And I know I'm, I'm really excited to take a second look at some of the things that maybe I haven't noticed before. We've got a number of questions. So as always, if you've got a question for Liz, type it in that Q&A box. Um, we've got some coming in by Q&A. We've got some emails. There's a lot, people got lots of questions. So we're gonna get to those, but uh, also just a little sneak preview. Stay tuned because after the questions, we have a really exciting announcement about some coming attractions. So stay with us. Um, all right, first question is, was there an attempt to get back the remaining 200 items that were not returned, right? You told us 296 made it back, but did, did they kind of go to bat again later to try to get the other pieces back or was that, was that the end of it? So um, Kenoma came back with half the works basically. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, people were very, a lot of people were very upset with him and they said, you know, how come you didn't get all of them, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. 
So um, I, no, there, there was some discussion about trying to get back the other works, but really at the end of the day, Pius VII figured the whole idea was to kind of create peace. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, the argument, one of the, one of the major arguments that they were using to return the works was, you know, in the interests of peace, this painful wound that you inflicted in the middle of hostilities a way for you for people to to believe that you actually want to make pieces to return them so at the end of the day the vatican kind of figured they wanted the major works back and then and then the others they just let go mm -hmm. got it switching gears a little bit we've got a question about those dual sarcophagi of um saints helena and uh costanza so one of our uh attendees asked do they do, do they now or did they at any point actually contain the remains or are those someplace else or do we know sort of how that all worked so they were originally um made for the remains so all right to be perfectly accurate the sarcophagus of uh, St. Helena was probably made for somebody else, most likely mm. the husband of Costanza, because it's a very, like the theme on it is very warlike. So it doesn't really make sense that it was made for, you know, the, the Dowager Empress. But the thought is that it was made for probably the husband of Costanza. But uh, since Helena died, it was instead employed for her. It was put into her tomb in the Via Prenestina, which says, you know, tomb of Helena, yada, yada, yada. So people knew it was hers. Mm. Then, um, the, the, the sarcophagus was taken and she was already moved out of the sarcophagus many, many years earlier and placed into a tomb in Aracheri. So you can see the tomb of St. Helena in the church of Aracheri in the Capitoline Hill. The one of Costanza originally contained the body of Costanza. It was inside a mausoleum constructed in, in the fourth century, 354 Costanza, on top of the catacomb complex of St. Agnes. And her sarcophagus was in there. But what they ended up doing was making a resin copy. So they made a kind of uh, almost like a plastic copy. It wasn't plastic, it was plastic at the time, but kind of like it was like a heavy duty paper mache copy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the original is in the Vatican museums. So they originally contained the bodies of both saints, but now they're both empty. And, and Costanza's back. She's in the same mausoleum she built all those years ago. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, question about Canova. Um, so uh, one of our one of our attendees notes that there is a museum of his works in uh, in Posano, which is pretty cool. But what uh, what sort of became of Canova? What happened to him next after things reopened? Canova, things reopened. <laughs> That's such an interesting sound to it. Yeah. Um, the uh, the Canova. Hi. Um, Canova was incredibly successful. He was given a rather large cash gift, um, but also he was um, given a knighthood. Uh, he started uh, work on what he hoped to be his mausoleum in Fosagnano, which is where he's from. He was building a, um, a sort of a mausoleum for himself, but he was working on all these different projects here in Rome. He died, uh, so he was sort of 1822 ish, but really um, having seen the works return, having uh, treated as you know the greatest artist of his day. So he really, if you will, he went on on a high note. Mm -hmm. What was the what was the sort of collecting philosophy of the Vatican Museums after Canova? So Canova's job was actually to create the collecting philosophy. Actually, that is what oh, his job will become. So that's actually really that's a very good that's a very good question. He is the one who starts thinking. All right, what are we going to put into this collection? He's his job, which was originally invented by Leo X for Raphael is to decide, you know, what stays, what goes. And he has a very interesting, he has a very interesting statement that he does not like works that are heavily restored, but um, he uh, has certain collections. So for example, I'll give you an example. There was a collection coming um, up for sale. It was, it was supposed to be sold to the French. He did not want the collection to leave for France, but the French had already, was, was, they had already entered into negotiations. Canova walked in and paid for the collection himself and donated it to the Vatican. So he has oh, very, very clear ideas about the kinds of things he wanted. He, he got interested in also collecting Egyptian works. Um, there was because mm. of Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. He got interested in collecting Egyptian works. So some of the early Egyptian pieces came in and he was terribly active. 
wonderful man, very helpful yeah. to the artists, um, all the artists who suffered. So I keep thinking of him during the pandemic, uh, during his, during, you know, during the period of the, 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 the revolution, um, all the artists were out of work. Everybody who worked in the arts was completely out of work in Rome. And he uh, kept trying to find them jobs and uh, mm. really, he was <laughs> really often used his own money to help people quietly. He was a remarkable person, used yeah. his leverage to try to improve the treatment for Napoleon. And that reminds me, if you'll forgive me, there's one note I meant to make about Pius VII, which is one of the reasons why I'm very, very attached to Pius VII. And I think of him a great deal as kind of a, as a beacon and how one should behave. Um, I told you about all the humiliations that Napoleon subjected him to, threats, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't tell you is that when Napoleon was eventually sent to St. Helena and he was, you know, maltreated he was sick he was alone he was it was he was he was the worst of the worst of the prisoners the only person who wrote to intervene on his behalf was Pius the seventh so mm. it, and he gave his mother and his brother a place to live here in Rome so he really showed tremendous uh, uh, generosity uh, towards the people who had maltreated him I, I, I he's a he's a he too is a very remarkable character yeah well uh, lots of lots of notes of thanks and appreciation coming in certainly, but I think we'll uh, we'll end with this question, which is, if people uh, want to know more, want to follow you, want to see what you're up to or what you're doing, where can they find you, Liz? Where where should they check you out? Well, I have a website. It's elizabeth-lev.com. Um, I uh, and you can always find me on Twitter, which is Liz Love Rome. And um, yeah, yeah, you'll be able to find me somewhere between those things. Okay, perfect. And if yeah, if if none of that works, just you know, give us a shout and we'll we'll get, we'll get you connected. Certainly, um, Liz, thank you so much. This has been such a fun series. I I feel like we've gotten this really unique perspective on uh, on the museums and this really important transformative period that I think we sometimes take for granted and we don't we don't think about how much really shifted. Uh, so thank you so much. It's been so much fun. Thank you. It's been really great for me too. Bye to all you California patrons. <laughs> well, for our California patrons, don't leave just yet. Um, I do have some exciting stuff to tell you about some coming attractions. So we have another series to let you know about, and you guys are actually the first to hear this announcement. So real big bonus for sticking around all the way through the questions. You'll see this roll out uh, in the coming days, but we are so pleased to announce an upcoming collaboration with our good friends, uh, the Friends of the Uffizi Gallery. We will be presenting a four part lecture series beginning Saturday, June 5th. So if you've got this 10 o'clock hour blocked off on Saturdays, you've got, uh, got a couple weeks off, but then come right back and join us, please. Saturday's beginning June 5th at 10 a.m. We will go back in time just a little bit um, with, uh, with one of our one of our good friends and a lecturer whom I'm sure many of you have, have heard before, uh, Rocky Ruggiero. He'll be talking to us about the Medici and the Della Rovere family. So really thinking about the connections between these two great Renaissance families and how their collections of art really became the nucleus of what today, of course, is the Uffizi Gallery in Florence and the Vatican Museums in Rome. So we've got four lectures talking about the ways in which art was used in diplomacy and in languages of power and in conflict and in, you know, various different, um, various different settings and the ways that those those works of art became the collections that we know today. So we really hope you'll join us for this series. Um, we'll send you an email about it, certainly, everybody who's been registered for this. So keep an eye out for that. But if you if you want to get a jump on it, you can register today at californiapatrons.org slash virtual events. So registration is open. Uh, like I said, those lectures begin Saturday, June 5th at 10 a.m. Pacific, and we'll, we'll run for four weeks. As always, you can catch any part of the lectures that we've enjoyed with Liz, uh, part of today that maybe you wanna watch again, or if you missed a week, you can head to our YouTube channel, California Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums. We always have those videos up 
within 24 hours. So do check those out. Also keep an eye on your email inbox because we will send you a reminder with that link. So check out anything you've missed uh, or maybe go back and watch something again. And I just like to thank all of you for being with us. Um, you've heard me say this now several times, but of course we at the patrons uh, are really committed to continuing to support the work of the Vatican Museums and certainly that work of conservation, of restoration, and of, of preserving these tremendous works of art has continued through a very challenging year. And now that the museums are open again, although in, in limited capacity, uh, that work continues to be so important. So if you would like to support the work of the patrons and in so doing support the conservation efforts and restoration efforts for the Vatican Museums, we would be deeply grateful. You can make a gift in any amount, which will go directly to the COVID-19 Relief and Support Fund for the Vatican Museums by visiting californiapatrons.org slash donations. And of course, if you're joining us and you're not a member of the patrons, uh, consider consider becoming a patron. We'd love, to, we'd love to have you. Of course, there are wonderful benefits anytime that you visit the museums in Rome, which hopefully will become much more possible and accessible in the months to come, but also, as you'll have seen from this lecture series, uh, a wonderful array of benefits here uh, at home as well. Everything from exclusive lectures to museum tours to the opportunity to hear about the latest and greatest in the Vatican Museum. So at any time, if you'd like to join the California Northwest chapters or a chapter near you, you can find us on the web, uh, californiapatrons.org, and we can connect you with a chapter near you if you are anywhere else in the world. So on behalf of all of us at the California Northwest chapter of the Patrons of the Arts and the Vatican Museums, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to Liz for an absolutely wonderful series. And we really hope to see you again in June for our next lecture. But in the meantime, our very best wishes to you and your families. Take care and we'll see you next time.